Uh, my talk will be focusing on IPython notebook for data analysis. I feel like I need to be a rock star and take this with me, all right? Uh, my name is John Lin. Uh, you can check out my website. I'm a true car data scientist. We're hiring. Uh, if you're interested, uh, the gentleman who won one of the t-shirt, Chris. Uh, Chris, if you want to raise your hand, he'll be very interested to, to talk with you. Uh, I'll give a shout out to my colleague, Rudy, who will be presenting uh, in two talks. And Emily, are there other true car people here? Okay. All right, cool. All right, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm working at, all right? I'm gonna do this. There we go. All right, so I'm working at True Car. I work at a, uh, a combination of projects that's analytics driven, uh, as well as more like uh, data engineering. Uh, my background is in experimental e economics uh, from Caltech and University of Michigan. Uh, I see some techers here. Let's raise your hands for a techer. Or once was a techer. Okay, this one back there. Anyone from University of Michigan? Oh, we have one back there. Okay, excellent. No, it's like, they're even like different divisions of uh, competition, right? Division one, division three. Uh, so yeah, so I have uh, my SAS background is more from the econometric perspective. Uh, and yeah, also game theory and mechanism design, which most people don't think about that when they talk about data science, but that's, that's part of my background. Uh, and in terms of my, my experience as a programmer, I built web-based financial markets at Caltech in Michigan. And right now I'm sort of building a robust data pipelines at TrueCar. Okay, so my talk, think of my talk as having two levels. There's a big picture, which is this slide. And I'm going to dive into kind of the specifics. If you lose track of the specifics, don't worry too much about it. I hope the specifics will be something like, you know, in two years or six months or five years, you're working with IPython notebook. You'll come across something and you'll say, oh, okay, John Lin mentioned something about this. Let me look into it. Okay, so those are the specific things. But I want you to keep in mind the big picture. Okay, what I hope you, you'll get, take away from this talk is this. Uh, IPython notebook is easy to install. That's echoing uh, John Fry's uh, comment. Uh, and I'm going to also do more like the interactive thing for part of the talk. So I hope I can show that it is easy to install. Uh, IPython notebook is a powerful environment in its own right. And this is a little bit deceptive. I think if you just look at it, it's like, oh, it's a browser. It's something I can do in a browser. What's the big deal? But I want to try to convince you, or, or at least throw out this idea that it is a very powerful environment in its own right. I'll try to show some things that supports uh, programming uh, interactively in, in the IPython notebook. And so aside from being a powerful environment in its own right, it's also kind of the foundational environment for Pandas and Matplotlib and other packages. John talked about a lot about Pandas and all the uh, clips, that, the images that you saw him put up is from IPython notebook, right? Yeah, so it's really actually hard for me to imagine how you would play with pandas. The key thing about pandas is interactivity. So without pandas, I'm going to go into this in a slide, but kind of just to preview, it would be really, really awkward if you don't have the IPython notebook environment. You have great like tools like uh, pandas, but IPython notebook is kind of like the sandbox in which you can play with all these cool toys. That's kind of my personal view about IPython notebook. Uh, okay, so yeah, it's a very good tool. That's why I want you to keep in mind. Okay, so that's the big picture stuff. Now I'm sort of like, now we're sort of like switch gears and like dive into uh, kind of like details, some excitement, if you will. We're gonna sort of dive into the canyon and like just go around and see what we find. Okay, so but this is a roadmap. Uh, I'm going to, Actually, I'm not going to install IPython notebook, but I'll show you how to do it. Uh, and I'm going to look into some interesting features of IPython notebook. And then I'm going to point out the, the pros. And I'm not calling them and cons. Uh, I would say gotchas, like something that you want to be aware of when you're working with IPython notebook. Uh, and, and a quick slide about if you want to learn more, uh, what are the resources you can look at? Okay. So if you're going to install uh, IPython notebook, you would type in 
pip install and then the list of packages. So there's the IPython package you want. And also, you need to install actually a few other packages uh, like PyZMQ, Jinja2, and Tornado. Uh, I'm not going to do it live because PyZMQ takes a bit longer to build on a Mac. It's just uh, wasting our time here. Uh, but it's just like one or two minutes. You can do this uh, on a Mac in like under two minutes. Uh, and then to run and launch the IPython notebook from your shell, you would just type IPython notebook. And what that will do is it will just launch the browser for you. It's running a web uh, server uh, on your local machine. Uh, and then you can just connect to it using uh, your browser. So one thing I want to sort of point out, this could be a confusing part. When you install the IPython package, there is the IPython shell. So you just type in IPython, you'll get the interactive shell, much like when you type in Python. Okay? But what I'm going to focus on today is the IPython notebook, which is a web browser-based web browser environment. Okay? So just make sure we, we make a distinction of uh, those two concepts. All right. So now I'm going to switch gears, and the next part will be a little bit more of an interactive performance art, if you will. Let's see how we do here. All right, so let's go to the shell. OK, so uh, like I mentioned, if you want to install, you would just do something like pip install IPython. They have really slow internet connection, so actually I would suggest you not try to do this right now. Uh, but to launch it, I installed it already. So to launch it, you would type just IPython notebook. And that's going to launch a browser for you. I don't know why this isn't working. That's fine. Uh, go to Firefox. And by default, it's going to run on port 8888. Okay? And you can specify port numbers. Those are kind of the details. So what you get uh, right away is this uh, Sort of this interface, I list all the IPython notebook you have in your directory. So one of the IPython notebook I created was this Python data science notebook. So I'll click on it. OK, so I'm just going to go through this. All right. OK, so a, a fundamental concept in an IPython notebook is this notion of a, a cell. So a cell can be a text string, and it can contain code. And even a text string, it takes a, a lot of different format. It can be a raw format. It can be Markov text. Uh, so this is really nice, right? This is like really encourages you to document your code as you write it. So the first line is just a cell, and it's just a text. This is an example of IPython notebook, blah, blah, blah. Uh, right? So in an actual cell, if you have a a code, like you can import pandas as PD, right? You would just type that in a cell. So notice, by the way, in a cell, I want to mention you could type in one line of text, or you can type in like a gazillion lines of Python code and run it, and you can do that. But my personal preference in terms of IPython notebook is to keep it, uh, keep it short, each cell short. Because when you run the code, you're not running through the whole program. You're running it cell by cell. I mean, you could run through the whole, all the cells, but even when you do that, the building block is just running one cell and running another cell and so forth. OK. So in this case, we do have pandas installed. So we didn't get an error message. Uh, another thing that's cool about the IPython notebook that you may not uh, notice at first is you can actually run shell command directly from an IPython notebook. Right? So if you want to copy files between directories, uh, if you want to uh, install a package, you don't have to go back to your, you know, this shell to do it. You can just do it here. And the way you would tell IPython notebook that like you're not executing Python code, you're actually executing a shell command, is by adding the exclamation mark in front of it. Right? So in the shell, I would type pip install pandas. But in IPython notebook, I can just do exclamation mark. Uh, and then the output of that command will be displayed to you, will be printed. Right? So in this case, I have already installed IPython notebook, I mean pandas. 
So yeah, it just says requirement already satisfied. Okay, all right, I can move on. Uh, another thing I was going to do was actually I was going to uh, show, yeah, you can also run get clone. And actually that particular address is the, the data for the book that someone just won Wes McKinney's uh, data analysis with Python. So there's this very nice repository that has all the data sets, it has all the IPython notebook from the book in that Git repository. Uh, it's a big file, uh, big folder, so I'm not gonna try to do that. But okay, but I did put this in for a purpose. So if I were to run this cell, one thing you want to know is, okay, in the internet connection here is very slow. So one thing you want to be able to, to do in an IPython notebook is when things sort of get out of hand, Sometimes when you load a data set, it's really huge, and it's like just churning and churning and churning. You want to have a way to interrupt it or to restart the kernel. So what you would do is you would go up to this kernel, and you can do, in this case, I want to do interrupt. Okay, so you just kill that, the process for that particular cell. Okay, this is useful to know when you actually work with data, and you know, it's like you're just waiting, you want to be able to kill it uh, and move on. When you just interrupt a cell, it keeps all the things in memory, right? But if you restart the kernel, then you wipe everything from memory, so you have to go back to the beginning of your uh, notebook if you have dependencies in, in your uh, workflow. Um, so here's another example, right? If I want to run this range 10 to the uh, 10, um, I run it. When you're running it, it'll show you this upper right hand corner, that like kernel is busy, it means something is happening. Another way it gives you fee uh, visual feedback is you have this asterisk in front, it's showing you that like, it's running the cell. Uh, once again, more as a footnote, but sometimes the asterisk is not in the cell that it's running, it's somewhat deceptive. The asterisk, so anyway, when things are confusing, just know that the asterisk is informative but can be contribute up as well. Okay, so once again, I don't want to wait until they finish counting. I made a mistake maybe in typing in some for loop. So let me go interrupt it again. So it's say interrupting kernel. And sometimes actually when you do interrupting kernel, it also like, I don't know exactly why, but it takes forever to actually, for the process to, to uh, die. In this case, I have run out of memory, which is good. This is planned, okay? So one thing I want to show is you have to quit the browser because it's inputting a bunch of stuff in HTML, right? So you can, one thing that can happen when you use IPython notebook is it'll crash your browser. But the nice thing is even if you quit your browser and you just reconnect to that instance, all that crash with your browser. It, it's not that IPython notebook instance. So you just bring up, uh, Another, you know, another window. And actually, I can just go back to this original one, click on this. Okay, and I should, I, I'm good. I mean, this is showing it's running. That's what I'm saying, even I have actually killed the process and started a notebook again, uh, it's show, still showing this asterisk sign. Um, okay. All right, so one of the points, the big picture I wanted to point out was IPython notebooks support, uh, has good utility to support programming. And one of the things it does is it does, now this is not super advanced compared to some other programming editors like PyCharm, things like that. Uh, but it does have some pretty nice support, right? So for example, if you want to uh, use this ReCSV method in Pandas and you don't remember the arguments, and you won't because it's crazy. What you can do is after you type in the name of the method, if you just do like the left paren and wait. Okay. Let me do this just in case. Uh, what? Is stop. Let me do this. Okay. All right, let's try this again. Okay, yeah, so here, 
you know, actually give you like the arguments that you need for the, for the method, right? So that's really convenient when you forget about the details. You have a way, you know, you don't have like go open down the browser, look for the documentation. It tells you what are the arguments that method is expecting. So that's one thing you can do. Another thing is it allows you to type the doc string of a method. So, uh, so what you can do is after the method, you're typing a question mark and it will pop out this thing in the bottom here and it'll tell you type function, you know, just like information about this method. So it has a way for you to, uh, to look at, to find the documentation about different packages, about different methods and whatnot. So that's really helpful. Uh, so here, this won't work because I actually didn't get a chance to download the CSV file. But in actuality, when I did this before, uh, you can just read in a CSV file, and, and this is in Panda. So this data is uh, the data frame that John was referring to. And yeah, I'm, I'm not going to, to Pandas, that's not the focus, but I just want to show, you know, you just read in the CSV file, you see, you can do like the head method on the data frame, and you see the first few rows. Uh, so, I mean, this is really powerful, right? Like, you can browse through this data frame and look at it and play with it. It goes back to this notion that, you know, the, this, all these tools allow you to get closer to your data, right? You can sort of, like, touch them in a way that it's harder to do with SQL. Or if you write an independent program, run it, and going back and forth, you have this environment that integrates a lot of useful tools together in one place. Uh, there are lots of special features in IPython notebook. I'm not going to go into them all. Just know like there's something called magic, uh, magic commands, and those are usually uh, a command that's preceded by either one percent uh, percentage sign or two. So in this one particular one, time it is going to time the how long it takes to run a particular chunk of code, but it's going to run it for like many loops by default. And they'll give you like uh, basically a sampling of how like you can profile your code uh, within the IPython notebook. Okay, another point that uh, I want to highlight that John also mentioned uh, in the IPy about IPython notebook is it's very easy for people to save their IPython notebook and publish it. So here is an example. If you just Google it, you'll also find the IPython notebook repositories. Okay, so here's an example of an IPython notebook that actually, like, so, like people have written books in IPython notebook, right? So it has the text, uh, it basically reads like a book, beautiful list, and they, they can have like code inserted in it, uh, math. This one is not dynamic, this is just static, but this is where it's really powerful, right? The IPython notebook community can share their IPython notebook with each other and people can look at each other's code to do different things, right? It has the graphic embedded in it so you can view the graphs as well. In the next talk, we'll talk more about uh, data visualization. Uh, but once again, it's nice because everything is together. Everything is within reach as you're working with your data. You want your focus to be on the data, right? Not on the tools you're using. Um, okay, so that's the last point, uh, sort of interactive uh, thing I want to do with the IPython notebook. Let me switch back to the PowerPoint slides. Okay, all right, so now sort of popping up more to the big picture. Uh, uh, things about IPython notebook, their pros and cons, or gotchas, gotchas, not cons. Okay, so the pro, the big, big takeaway is it's interactive. IPython notebook supports interactive uh, programming. And for data analysis, that's a pretty big deal. When I first started doing data analysis, I thought, who cares? You know, I mean, it's nice, but I can do this by writing a, a Python program and do the same thing, right? Well, it turns out not exactly, right? Because imagine the alternative. You have to have 
uh, a window with your text file. That, uh, that has your program. You need to modify your program, save it, run it, run your program, look at the output, like a text file or image. And even if you want to look at the image, then you have to click on the image again and see it some other way, like maybe pop up in a browser. Right? But in IPython notebook, you do all of that in the same environment. Okay. And yeah, the IPython notebook, along with pandas, with matplotlib, uh, and all the packages, they really form a really powerful collection of tools uh, for you to use uh, to iteratively examine, process, and visualize your data. And the key thing is in data analysis, you, you will need to do that. Right? It's like shaping a clay. It's like you just sort of work with the data, you're going to have an idea, and you're going to, oh, let me shape the data a different way. And as you play with the data, things are going to come to you. And that's why IPython, why this like, ecosystem, I think, is, is very good. It's very good. All right, now some gotchas about the IPython notebook. This won't make a lot of sense, especially if you haven't touched it. But like I said, this is like, you know, if in two weeks, OK, I will stop. I just mentioned, what do I want to mention? It outputs HTML. So because it outputs HTML, it's hard to use like tools like diff. OK. But like I said, the big picture is it's powerful, it's good. That's what I want you guys to, to take away with. Okay? All right.